Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to have uh, Dr. Daila Baron from uh, Carnegie, and they're going to tell us about their work on finding uh, simple structures in complex data sets. Uh, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, despite the rainy weather. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how we find simple structures in complex data sets. And basically, as scientists, what we're trying to do is to observe the complex universe around us and derive some simple laws or simple rules that describe this observed complexity. So in some sense, science is compression. And the question is, how do we extract this simplicity from the complexity we observe around us? And there are various ways of doing that. One of them is, for example, finding simple structures in our data sets. One of them are classes, as you are well familiar. Uh, astronomers like classifying things, clustering things into classes. I'm listing just uh, a partial list of the type of classes we give astronomical objects. And this is sort of compression, because we're moving from countless number of objects into several defined classes. It can also allow us to extract physical meaning by comparing the properties of objects within class to properties of objects in different classes. So we can learn something new about the physics that govern the objects we're interested in. Another type of simple structure is a sequence. And I'm defining a sequence as a set of properties that changes continuously as a function of some leading parameter. Uh, and perhaps the most uh, natural sequence we can think of is a sequence as a function of time, where the time is our leading parameter. Here you can see a one-dimensional object, a spectrum flux as a, function, as a function of wavelength, changing continuously as a function of time. But sequences do not only have to be as a function of time. The leading parameter can be something else. It can be the mass the luminosity, the density, the temperature. And I would argue that in many cases in astronomy, what we're seeing is not classes, but rather sequences. We have these physical processes that as a function of some leading parameter will cause some continuous change over a wide range of properties. And one of my favorite examples to show uh, for a very successful dimensionality reduction in astronomy is the stellar sequence you can see here. So on the left, you're seeing optical spectra of stars. And you can also see our classification of these stars here. And what you can see is that at first sight, these spectra appear rather complex. We see that each spectrum has a different continuum. Some are bluer, some are redder. They have these absorption lines. Some are narrow, some are broader. They change from one spectrum to the next. So at first glance, these spectra appear rather complex. But on the other hand, we know that if we plot stars in the temperature versus luminosity diagram or the color magnitude diagram, we see that all the stars in the universe occupy a very narrow range in this parameter space, basically a one-dimensional sequence. And this tells us that all the properties of the observed stars can be explained to a first order only using the temperature. And this tells us that all of this complexity we see here on the left can be attributed to this single parameter, the temperature of the star. And this is very powerful because it constrains the physics that we're interested in when we're talking about stars. Now, in order to obtain uh, this uh, amazing relation, it took astronomers tens of years of observations and analysis. And the question is whether now we can do that automatically with the tools we have now. So one idea of how to do something like this is to apply dimensionality reduction algorithms, which are sort of unsupervised machine learning algorithms, to our data set. These will be used to embed our high dimensional uh, data set into a low dimensional space, like you see here for the MNIST data dataset, where each image here is a 28 by 28 feature uh, object, uh, which we embed into a lower dimensional space. And if we're doing it properly, 
we can hope that this lower dimensional space traces some interesting information about the structure of my objects in the high dimensional space. The challenge with these type of algorithms is that they depend on several hyperparameters. My resulting representation here depends on a set of hyperparameters I need to choose for each such algorithm. And it is not clear in advance what is the correct choice to be made. In addition, all of these algorithms have to assume some distance measure between the objects in the sample, some sort of similarity measure. And as you all know, different data sets, different distance measures will be sensitive to different features in our data set over a certain scale. It is not clear a priori that there is a generic distance metric that can be applied to all data sets. So in practice, when people use tools like this, they are doing sort of an iterative approach where they try a set of hyperparameters, they try some distance measure, they examine this lower dimensional space and they change it and change it, adding some domain knowledge into the problem until maybe, hopefully, some meaning will emerge. So in order to find these sequences automatically, we have developed an algorithm called the sequencer. And what the sequencer does, it takes an input data set, where here you see one-dimensional objects ordered in a random way from this data set. And what it does, it attempts to find the sequence in the data. If it finds a sequence, it reorders the objects in the data set according to this sequence. And what you're seeing here is a sequence in these narrow lines in the shape of this W. So how do we do that? We start with our raw data. Uh, which for representational purposes, I'm showing these as one-dimensional objects, spectral light curve, but this can also be applied to images and uh, cubes and uh, whatnot. And imagine that I have a good way to estimate distances between the objects in the sample. This means that I can convert this raw data into a graph describing the similarities of the objects, where every node in this graph represents an object in my original sample, and this object is connected by edges to all the rest of the nodes in the graph. So the graph is fully connected. The edges carry the information about the distance I have assigned. And there is a very important property of graphs, which is called the minimum spanning tree. The minimum spanning tree is the subset of the total edges of the graph in which I still can reach from every node to every other node in my graph, where the sum, the total weight of all the edges is minimal. So I have some global optimization taking place here. Now what we realized is that the shape of the minimum spanning tree traces valuable information regarding the topology of the data such that if I'm getting a minimum spanning tree, which is elongated, it tells me that I have some natural access within my data. Objects can be ordered one after the other in this narrow structure, which I call a sequence. So in this case, I can say that I have a sequence in my data and I can reorder the objects according to their location in this minimum spanning tree. Now, as I told you, we do not know in advance where the information is. Where is the relevant information I want to extract? What is the distance measure I should use? What are the relevant scales? Are the, in, is the information on small scales? Is it on large scales? Uh, so what we're doing with this uh, minimum spanning tree elongation, we're essentially using it as a figure of merit, as a score. We now have a number to optimize, and this is in contrast to standard dimensionality reduction algorithms, or uh, like TSNI and UMAP, where it is not clear what exactly I'm trying to optimize as a scientist. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking my raw data, and I'm examining a range of metrics and a range of scales. So estimating distances between objects on small scales, large scales using different metrics, and each of these results in its own minimum spanning tree. And some choice of metrics and scales will result in elongated trees, meaning that I have a natural ordering revealed by this distance metric and by this scale. 
So I can aggregate all of this information together while weighing according to this elongation to obtain my final sequence here. So in essence, what I'm doing, I'm finding the optimal distance metric and the optimal scale that are most sensitive to a presence of a sequence in my data. So this is an example with simulated data. What you see here on the left is the input. Here you can see a sample of the input object. Here is the full data set where every row represents uh, uh, these uh, spectra, let's say, color coded by the relative intensity. And you can see, so when the data set is ordered randomly, no meaning can emerge. We cannot understand what is there in this data. But once we the sequencer detects the sequence and reorders the objects according to this sequence. And meaning emerges. We see this W shape very well now, which we couldn't see here by eye. And I think the important uh, point about this example is that the information that is relevant to the presence of the sequence is small compared to the entire information every object carries. These lines occupy a small fraction of my entire vector. And in addition to these small lines, I have added additional noise or additional information using Gaussian processes, in some cases on very small scales, in other cases on very large scales. And our optimization makes sure that the sequencer is able to zoom into the correct information while ignoring the rest. So this is simulated data. Uh, here I'm showing you what it looks like when I break it down to different metrics and different scales. Every such rectangle here is the result of a specific distance metric and a specific scale. And you can see what they look like as a function of minimum spanning tree elongation. So high elongations result in significant sequences. Low elongation result in very weak or undetected sequences. So this score can tell me whether I was able to detect a sequence in my data, and it tells me which metric over which scale allowed me to do so. So now let's apply it to uh, several data sets from astronomy. Uh, I'm starting with the stellar spectra example. Here on the left you see uh, a sample of optical spectra of stars. Uh, and here you can see the full data set we considered of 1,000 uh, stars. This is the input to the sequencer. This is the output. So the algorithm detected the stellar sequence with the leading parameter of the temperature. You can see that the beginning of the sequence is dominated by blue young stars. The end of the sequence is dominated by these red older stars. And you see that all the absorption lines that beforehand seemed very complex they now fall into a one well-defined sequence. So this entire complexity can be now explained as a function of one parameter. And this tells us this, that sometimes these simple structures can, uh, can, can, have, a complex, uh, can have a complex type of um, view in our data set. Here is another example of optical spectra of quasars. Uh, this is the input to the algorithm. This is the output. So here I did not uh, de-redshift the objects uh, for the redshift. So what the sequencer finds here is actually the lines, the emission lines moving across the wavelength due to their redshift. And this is, again, this example really excites me because the amount of information we have in a single spectrum of a quasar, the emission lines change in their flux, in their width, the continuum changes, the line ratios change. But the sequencer was able to zoom into the information that is relevant to the sequence in the data, which is how these lines shift across wavelength. And again, I remind you that this algorithm does not know what is redshift, what is a quasar, what is a spectrum? I could have done this with examples outside of astronomy. I could have done this with EEG data, and it would have worked in the same way. And another very important point I wanted to make here is that contrary to other methods like PCA, which are sensitive to what happens within a given feature, the sequencer is able to track how information moves from one feature uh, to the next using some of the metrics we're using. So up until now, I haven't shown you anything new. 
cool. I rediscovered the, uh, the temperature sequence in stars and the redshift sequence in quasars, yay. Uh, but we also applied it to several data sets from astronomy, geology, and seismology, and discovered uh, a number of uh, new sequences and new correlations. Uh, from gamma ray bursts to white dwarfs to 21 centimeter data. Here I'm going to show you a few very uh, examples very fast of things that we already published. And the first example uh, is applying the sequencer to optical spectra of quasars after I redshifted them, okay? So in a uh, rest frame. So we applied the sequencer uh, to this data set and this is the sequence that we obtained. And in order to understand what this sequence means. The sequence we detected is significant according to the elongation parameter. So in order to understand what it means, we stacked the spectra along the index of the sequence. And this is what we found. We found a new correlation tying the properties of emission lines of quasars. We found a correlation that ties the width of the lines in the broadline region, so the kinematics of gas moving in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, with the ionization state of gas on kiloparsec scales in galaxies, the narrow line region. So we found this very nice correlation between the two, and this tells us something very interesting about accretion disk properties, about how the radiation that originates in the accretion disk, how it is shaped by the mass of the black hole, and how it then ionizes the gas on uh, kiloparsec scales. Now, it's important to note that this data set has uh, been studied by astronomers for uh, several decades, and this correlation has not been detected prior to the sequencer. And the reason is, again, it's not, the, the structure itself is simple once you know what is the direction to look at. Because it involves several different observables, unless we target this specific observable, this is something that is difficult to obtain just by exploring your data. And apart from giving us another clue about accretion disk physics, it allowed us this correlation to propose a new method to estimate black hole masses in obscured type 2 AGN, so in systems where we do not see the broadline region. And it allowed us to estimate black hole masses and plot them on the M sigma relation for 10,000 objects, increasing the sample size by two orders of magnitude compared to what uh, was available up until this point. Uh, another example, which I'll not go uh, to, to many details, but we also applied this uh, algorithm outside of astronomy. Uh, here, for example, we applied it to seismograms of waves that are uh, diffracting in the core mental boundary of Earth, finding a sequence that allowed us to identify new, previously unknown structures in this interface between the two. So, let me summarize. Uh, I'm arguing that science is about compression. We're trying to find the angle from which the problem appears at its most simplicity. simplicity. In some cases, it is very, it is very easy to detect uh, uh, simple relations. If these relations are uh, things, uh, are features that we actually measure, we can correlate one versus the other, and we can find these relations. And all the scaling relations in astronomy, uh, most of them have been detected uh, using this uh, method. But sometimes, simple structures can exist in our data, but they will appear complex because they occur over different scales, over different features, and it is difficult to see them by the feature extraction that we currently use. So for that, we developed the sequencer algorithm, which is a graph-based tool that is designed to generically find the sequence in the data. And at the base of this algorithm is the definition of the elongation, our method to define a score, a figure of merit. I'm running the algorithm, and using this score, I can say whether the algorithm found the sequence or did not find the sequence. And a similar type of methodology with elongation can actually be applied to other algorithms like TSNI and UMAP in order uh, to optimize for this exact problem. 
Um, and we apply this algorithm to different data sets within astronomy and outside of astronomy, and it led to uh, new uh, discoveries. If you're interested in the sequencer, the code is available, and we also have a web page where you can upload your data, and the, uh, our servers will reorder the data for you. This is my email if you have any questions, and that's it. Thank you. Beautiful talk. Um, I have a million questions, but I'll start with one. So this example of um, where the redshift was really obvious, um, it, does it make sense then to, let's say, okay, so now you know that there's redshift, um, to, to now look at the rest frame spectra and see what other sequence uh, comes out? Is that so, I, and, I mean, that's just one example. You could obviously imagine doing that with many data sets. Uh, this is an excellent uh, question. So. In some sense, us applying the sequencer to spectra of quasars in rest frame is exactly answering your question. If we already know that there is some leading parameter affecting our data which we want to remove, it is better to remove it in advance. I will say that this algorithm is designed to find a sequence as a function of one leading parameter. But I would argue that in many cases, this parameter will actually uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, be responsible for like 90% of the variance there. And we showed a few examples where the sequencer can be applied in a manner similar to PCA, where you can find a sequence, strip it from the data, and then resequence uh, the residuals to find the secondary sequence. Uh, in our GitHub repository, we do that with stellar spectra, and we show the temperature, and then I think the metallicity. It's the secondary sequence. Um, I'm curious, uh, like for the null result, like are there cases where you applied this method and it found no correlations or no leading parameters? And also, is this optimized for 1D data and not like 2 or 3D data? Uh, thank you. These are uh, very important questions. Uh, yes, we, we applied it to several data sets where the elongation we found, basically the elongation is a number that can go from uh, close to zero to the number of objects in your sample. And in some cases we applied it and we found not, not so significant sequences. So something like, I don't know, uh, 30, uh, 40 percent of uh, the data, which is not significant. And these results are obviously, I mean, that we could not extract something uh, very meaningful uh, of them. Um, and your second question was, yes. Um, so uh, this algorithm is generically, uh, can work with any dimension you want, as long as you have a distance measure, which can be applied uh, to this higher dimensional object. So for example, if you're interested in images, for example, you can apply Euclidean distance pixel-wise between these images, right? And you can apply the earth mover distance. So there are distances you can apply on images. So this type of tool can be applied uh, to images as well, cubes, uh, things like this. And we actually did some experimentation with that as well. Thank you, Daila. Very nice. Um, I just wanted to come back to this idea of when you have not a leading one but multiple, because you said, okay, I can separate them and try to you know, remove and go to the residuals. But in many cases, I think uh, you cannot separate. So how are you able to discover that if you know it's? So. Uh, I understand uh, your question entirely. So the nice thing about the sequencer is that it does not really require linearity or orthogonality between these different uh, features. What it does require is that the leading parameter will actually be detected significantly. So the sequence it will, uh, it will uh, produce will, uh, it will basically produce an elongated minimum spanning tree. You can think about a case where you have two leading parameters contributing exactly the same. In that case, you will have a minimum spanning tree that looks like a box. So in that case, we're failing. 
But uh, in terms of the non-linearity, uh, if still your leading parameter uh, gives the, the, the most variance, let's say, you can reorder the objects according to it. Uh, I can show it in the uh, quasar example or the stellar sequence example. So we have this ordered matrix here. We then smooth it with some kernel, and then we either divide or subtract our original matrix from the smooth version, resulting in residuals and reapplying the sequencer again. So there isn't any requirement of orthogonality there. So, and uh, these features can affect the spectrum in a non-linear way as well. Hey, Ada, a, a great talk and, oh, here. here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a great fans of um, what you do. I'll join something here. And um, just a quick question. So how do you deal with that stochastic field? So for example here, seems like you have the deterministic object, right? But uh, in, so like, like even for a time series, if you have uh, like time, like translational like invariance, you will need to take care of that first in order to do that. Um, so do I understand correctly? You, you're asking, for example, in, th in time series, whether uh, when they're not uh, sampled at the same time, yeah, and I when I, I have some periodicity I want to take yeah, into account. Yeah, stochastic field in general. Then I need to be smart about the way I'm choosing my metrics here. I will not choose Euclidean distance to estimate distances between time series because it makes no sense. Maybe I will convert the time series into periodograms and then uh, start with my periodograms. Maybe I will use the time warp distance. But as long as I have a meaningful way to measure distances between the objects, I'm fine. So uh, the challenge translates to whether I am able to, uh, to have these meaningful uh, distance measures. In some cases, I think that we found uh, appropriate measures. In some other cases, it is still a work in progress. Just one more question. Uh, Sucha Takure, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so it's uh, actually related to uh, your son's question. Um, so how would you deal it, deal with like uncertainties? Can you do you have like measures or scores that can deal with these uncertainties? Uh, yes, in principle, uh, again, if we're uh, if we can give a distance measure that uh, takes into account the uncertainties, we're able to deal with them. Uh, in practice, in these particular examples we did not take it into account uh, whatsoever. And we used in most of these cases a uh, high signal to noise uh, ratio da uh, dat data sets. And I want to note that I believe that in this particular example, it's okay. Uh, because what I'm after is the global structure within my entire data set. And this structure hopefully should be there for the higher SNR objects and the lower SNR objects. So that's okay to choose only the higher SNR objects to detect this structure. Uh, we also show in the GitHub that uh, we are able to then take the low SNR objects and populate them into uh, the resulting sequence. So if we want to have them as well, we can have them. Um, but in general, it is better to start with the higher SNR objects as long as you know that this does not bias your data set in a very significant way. Otherwise, there is a way to uh, deal with uncertainties. Uh, like in every case, this algorithm degrades, its performance degrades with, uh, uh, with uh, decreasing signal to noise ratio, but at least you have this score, the elongation that tells you whether you're doing uh, well or not.